Cypress Development Corp. is developing a world-class lithium resource in the heart of Clayton Valley, Nevada. The size of the resource makes the Clayton Valley project a premier asset with the potential to impact the future of lithium supply. Cypress Development Corp. trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol CYP, the OTCQB, symbol CYDVF, and on Frankfurt, symbol C1Z1. For more information, please visit our website, cypressdevelopmentcorp.com. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Stuart Muir, Executive Director of the Resource Work Society. Welcome back to the show, Stuart. Thanks, Jim. Stuart, you've been on an extensive tour of northern British Columbia where the Wet'suwet'en people live, work, and play. Uh, what have you been finding out about the pipeline project and what most of the people there say? And also, what have you learned out about the five hereditary chiefs opposed to the project? Yeah, I spent a good part of the last month. wasn't really planning to spend my winter this way, but because of events, I decided we better get up there. That's what, what Resource Works does. We try to go places where there's a lack of understanding, find out what's going on, and, and explain it. This was a a really great opportunity in a way because the people you normally expect to be doing that stuff, uh, people in the news media, weren't, weren't getting up to Smithers in that area to see what was going on except to cover a blockade. There was one blockade. That's what dominated the story. That's a small part of it to be sure, but really the bigger story, as I soon discovered in our time in the Bulkley Valley, was that there's something going on. There's there's a relatively small number of people in the Wet'suwet'en Nation, about 5,000 people. They live on reserves and off reserves. They live in the area. They live around the world. Um, but there's a good number that do live in that Bulkley Valley area, the area between the Hazeltons and Burns Lake, essentially is their traditional territory and, you know, the surrounding areas. And it so happens that a good, a good part of that area, especially the southern uh, part of it, is where the coastal gas link pipeline uh, will pass through. It's already being constructed and it's the pipe that will serve the LNG Canada project in Kitimat. So this is a monumental $40 billion project. I've heard tell it's the biggest infrastructure going on on the planet right now. Uh, certainly the biggest in Canadian history. But, uh, as, as far as the, the Wet'suwet'en people, far from the narrative and the headlines that somehow the Wet'suwet'en are against the pipeline, um, it's actually the exact opposite. When you start talking to people, you look at the uh, the uh, leadership that has gone into finding a way to create relationships with the pipeline company and the Wet'suwet'en people so that the land is respected, the water is respected. These are super important. Water is at the, the heart of their relationship with the land. And if anything should happen to the water, that would be absolutely unacceptable. Um, I've heard about the pipeline built there. 50 years ago, a gas pipeline through that same area. Back in those days, there was no consultation at all with the indigenous people. There were no benefits that spun off to local uh, First Nations, and none of that. Uh, it, the line disrespected, I heard this story from a gentleman I met uh, at the Stella 10 First Nation at the west side of Fraser Lake. He, he told me a story about a mountain up behind him that had some powerful representations in his in his lore and culture, and and that the pain that the the pipeline put there 50 years ago had caused because there was no consultation. They could have done some things better. This time around, it's it's such a different story. And I was hearing uh, from a number of local chiefs over the last few days. I was meeting with chiefs in Prince George this week who are concerned about losing opportunities for economic development. Um, I heard from uh, Maureen Lugie. She's the chief of the uh, Wet'suwet'en First Nation itself. There's 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 six uh, smaller groups or bands within the larger Wet'suwet'en Nation. One of them is called the Wet'suwet'en First Nation. I know it's confusing, um, but this is one of the groups. It's near Burns Lake. Well, they want to put the revenues they're getting from the coastal gas link pipeline into health care. They want to deliver programs for the people who live there. They also wanted to make sure that from the get-go in 2014, when they first started dealing with the pipeline people, that there was a, 
an open conversation to ensure that the cultural and environmental issues they had were all dealt with. And it's clear that they are completely satisfied that this has happened. So um, this is called progress in how you do things. And we have, uh, we've seen this in uh, five of the six uh, Wet'suwet'en First Nations. The only one that has not got a relationship with the pipeline is one that's way at the far upper end of it, uh, a long, long ways away from where the pipeline is. So there's really not a, a strong reason that that First Nation would really have much to do with this anyway. So so when you hear there's only five out of six, well, it's it's really the majority of First Nations, uh, all the First Nations that have more direct contacts with the pipeline route, who are with Soden, um, have, have endorsed it. But, you know, I think what's happened is there is, at least among those who are not up to date on the situation, there's probably a belief that what certain people are against it. And, uh, you know, I've met so many uh, people. They're, they're not just workers who've got jobs there. I know uh, there's an attempt to dismiss them. Well, they would they would support the pipeline. They're getting a job from it. Well, okay, you want to dismiss them. But I've heard from um, elders and hereditary chiefs who, who see something deeper, you know, housing opportunities. This is a – I'm not going to call any part of BC a backwater, but in a sense, you know, the world does not beat a – path to uh, the, the the door of, of that part of the world. They really have to uh, do things to make people come and invest, and having a pipeline like this actually does create that. And I've been hearing about First Nations workers who are employed in the mills. They're actually building what they call the pipe skids. So when they're putting the pipeline in, for that period, they have to bring the pipes out onto the land. They have to put them somewhere before they're stuck in the ground and welded together so they have these things, pipe skids that they rest them on. Those are being manufactured by Wet'suwet'en workers at a mill nine kilometers north of Wet'suwet First Station at the town of Morristown, and that's a direct benefit of the pipeline. Um, there's training going on. Uh, young people are learning to be chefs and cooks, so they can work in construction camps that are going to be located in Wet'suwet'en territory. You know, there was one gentleman, the uh, hereditary chief from the Little Frog Clan, the Lapsudiu, uh, his name is Gary Nazil. Uh, he showed up, I think, in a, a Globe and Mail article, and we also interviewed him. We, we've got some videos with with Mr. Nazil talking about the pride he has in no longer having to go to mines elsewhere in Alberta and B.C. to do a job, about the pride that he knew his grandparents and parents would have in him that he's doing his work on his traditional territory because he's working for the pipeline. I mean, such pride in his voice when we when we had this conversation, and that's just typical. Um, so, Jim, I would say that uh, the, the 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 strong there's a, not not everyone's a cheerleader for this project. There's a lot who are just sort of they're okay with it because they see the benefits. They're not going to get the pom poms out for it. You'll never see that, but they're they're okay on it. Stuart, how have Aboriginal people been treated by protesters at the legislature? Um, well, in terms of how the what's it have been treated by the the protests at the legislature in their name is one of the the weird things about this because you might think that those protesters with the banners, you know, what's sort strong and what's sort this, what's sort that, you might think they're what's sort people themselves. Well, well, they're not. I mean, I I don't know of a single one of those protesters. I hope you could prove me wrong on this, but but I've been looking for evidence uh, that there's even one what's sort in First Nation. So. Uh, they're not part of it. They're certainly not on the blockades that I know of in Toronto or, you know, Kingston, Montreal, anywhere else. Um, nothing to do with it. So what's really going on there? I've been asking what sort of people, what do you think of this? Um, they're ashamed. They're ashamed. I talked to uh, Councillor Clement Mitchell from Whitsitt uh, First Nation, which is the largest of the Whitsitt communities located in Morristown. And that's what they say. They have no right to do this. They're they are dragging our name into the dirt by this action because it does not represent our values. Um, nothing is more important to the Wet'suwet'en people I've talked to, they tell me, than respect, showing respect in the code of respect that is their ancient way. And I've been privileged to be able to, you know, come into the circle of knowledge on this uh, a little bit. I've, I've asked, I've asked if I could, uh, you know, have that knowledge. I, I'm going there to respect their, their, their way of life. And I don't want to intrude on their cultural privacy, so I've been very careful not to be, you know, one of those nosy outsiders who comes in. And so, so what I've learned though is is that this this uh, 
idea of respecting one's family, neighbors, oneself, uh, outsiders, anyone is, is core to everything. And, and it also explains the feast system, which is not, as I've said before, a, a buffet, although you can have food at a feast. The feast system is the way that, uh, the Wet'suwet'en people and others of the Northwest come together to resolve conflicts, to mark important milestones of people coming into the world or leaving the world, um, and 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 the clan system. You know, there's five clans. Each one is named after a, a creature, a real creature in, in nature. Um, they they have their their place in that feast house, and they have within themselves a hierarchy of authority and tradition. Um, hereditary chiefs are part of that, and the bestowal of names is, is a very, very important part in a people who in modern times uh, have been subjected to uh, all kinds of social, cultural disruptions. It's been tough to keep all that together, and they're, res- they're reviving their language. One of the things I've heard, you know, I went to the, the Winston First Nation band hall. I was able to go in um, to the daycare where there was an elder from one of the carrier nations uh, in that area who was teaching the language, passing it on to the children. This was a, an older gentleman, and he was speaking in carrier. I was able to, to just be a flying wall in that room for a few minutes, thinking how important it, it is to be able to share one's own language with the younger generation. And, and I mean, I don't know if it sounds like that's important or not, but believe me, it's so, so centrally important that the language be preserved, and they have a beautiful place. It was built with money. They they got through the deal with the pipeline that they should have this warm, uh, architecturally lovely location where the elders can come and share their knowledge. And there's, you know, the federal government is not building buildings like that for for these nations. Um, they they don't spend a lot of money on this, but they they got it done because of the relationship they had. Um, I mean, that's that's about keeping culture together. It's it's about, um, you know, young people in Indigenous Canada. We have a terrible, terrible problem in this country with suicide. It's just the rate is abominable. And um, a lot of the elders will tell you that the, the integrity of, of language and culture is, is what's going to save the next generation, their kids and grandkids, from, from this. And also having the pride of a job, having a trade, having the ability to do something on your own traditional territories. You know, they don't have a, you know, uh, Amazon warehouse they could go to work at in Birds Lake or, you know, a law firm. Um, or maybe they have a law firm in Birds Lake. I'm sure they do. But they, you know, they don't have urban jobs galore like, like we do in Vancouver. They have to deal with the things they've got. They've had mills close. They've had a couple Landaco and Huckleberry Mines close. These opportunities are not there right now in the local area. The pipeline is, and it is employing as many local people as, as want to work in it. So that's why it's so welcome. I mean, it's tied to these cultural and health issues. We'll have more with Stuart Muir right after this. Media recognition from Bloomberg, Writers, Recycling Trade Publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the U.S., AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Avon Resources Limited is a gold exploration company with significant projects in British Columbia and the Yukon, trading on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ABN, and the OTCQB, symbol ABNAF. Surrounded by world-class gold deposits and mines, Avon's 23,000 hectares Forest Kerr Gold Project is located in the heart of the Golden Triangle in northwestern BC. For more information, visit us at avonresources.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Stuart Muir. Stuart, the Supreme Court of Canada will not hear an appeal of BC groups op- opposed to the Trans Mountain Pipeline. There were two First Nations, environmental groups, and some teenage activists. The challenges were based on a claim Indigenous people were not properly consulted. Is this a relief that there's been yet another high court ruling on this? Well, for the, the success of the project, it's certainly a relief to know that the three to zero ruling 
in the Court of Appeal was is, is not going to be challenged. Uh, that's a very strong outcome. It wasn't like it was two to one. It, w- it was a clear ruling. And, and if you go back to the text of that ruling, for anyone who read it, what really resonated with me and stuck with me is some of the language. I don't have it at hand. I can't quote it. I'm sorry. But um, the, the judges were clearly weary of the use or abuse that has been made of the courts over Trans Mountain. And we see it with similar cases with other resource projects where, look, you've been to the well 20 times, 22, 23 times. You know, almost every instance, it's the same answer from the judges that the the, the thing you're appealing uh, or you're challenging is actually legally on firm ground. Now, in the case of Trans Mountain, there was one judicial setback for the project that resulted in a whole year of extra work being done on the killer whale protection and also the indigenous consultation, those two pieces where there there were deficiencies in, in the process, that was remedied, and that's why the project's moving ahead now. But there was, in the language of the ruling, it was just, you know, courts are not here to be this sort of infinite uh, um, uh, resource for anyone who's got enough money that they can fundraise for a lawsuit. You can just go back time and time again, um, in many cases ask the same questions, I think there's going to be in future less patience from the courts with that approach. You know, more than 20 times in the case of Trans Mountain. Come on, let's accept that this thing is happening. Let's make sure it's the best thing. Um, you know, I think for the the two First Nations whose whose names are on that, the, the Squamish, for the the Salwatu, these are honorable nations that have got genuine uh, aspirations for success. Um, they have unresolved uh, conflicts. In, in their past and and issues, there are also ones that have access to the whole urban metro Vancouver area as a place where, with their land uh, rights and and uh, ability to monetize that, they're actually on a on a good track. Especially the Squamish to be very successful and ensure that their uh, future generations are well looked after. So they're they're in a good place, and I think uh, uh, they they also have have fears over tanker safety and that's a super important thing so i think it's really important for those who are in charge of tanker safety to um make sure that there's not lingering frustration that that the squamish concerns and the sale of two concerns aren't being heard just because there's a you know judicial outcome i think seeking ways to work with the young people there uh, make sure there are opportunities that are real and tangible and accessible for for those from those nations but um and there's lots of other people who live in Metro Vancouver too, and they want uh, to have a quality of life. And a lot of that does stem from Canada's largest export, which is crude oil, getting a fair price. And right now, we're we're being held back as a country, all of us, all Canadians, because we're selling that oil for less than it's worth because we don't have a pipeline in place that will let us get it, get the oil to to, to better markets. And that's what this is all about. It's really no one's doing this. Oh, how can we create more risk for tankers? And that's not what this is about. And indeed, those risks are are well managed. But you know, it, it's about uh, nation building, making Canada um, a more secure place over the long term. How do the Wet'suwet'en people feel about the continued roving blockades Vancouver seeing on its streets? It seems every night now during rush hour. Yeah, well, I talk whenever I get a chance to ask a Wet'suwet'en person about this, I do, and. Um, I guess there's a couple out there. I haven't actually met them who, who, who think it's a great idea, but um, what what I do hear is, as I mentioned, uh, uh, counselors from Wichita Village have told me, business leaders who are Wichita and then operate Wichita and businesses with Wichita and employees. Um, I've talked to the owner who's not Wichita and of a mill north of Wichita Village, but he employs uh, almost all Wichita uh, workers. Um, they they are happy to have work and happy to have some economic uh, benefit. There's a big feeling in the Bulkley Valley that, you know, this town of Smithers, which is a very prosperous little place, you can get a latte and get a nice organic sandwich, and there's a couple of nice bookstores, boutiques, that sort of thing. A lot of people work in mining exploration. Lots of civil servants and teachers live there. They they always put in very left-wing counsel and and uh, support their their local NDP there's a sense that they they live in a bubble and don't appreciate that a few miles away from 
lovely little smithers, there's a lot of what certain people who, who don't have opportunities, who live in hardship, who, who live crowded eight to nine in a house that's dilapidated, who don't have an option for better housing, um, you know, that these, uh, kind of elites who are, who are smug and, um, eco proud, they, they are ignoring the, the real wishes of the Wet'suwet'en people, which, which are really simple wishes, for, as far as I can tell, is to have respect, to be respected, to respect others, to have uh, food on the table. I mean, it is food on the table. I talked to a couple of workers who were laid off because of the, the blockades out of work. And this one gentleman, I don't want to name names here, but it's, this is true, I interviewed him. He had $1,100 for the month. He was with his son, 14-year-old, um, with some, some learning challenges. And it was heartbreaking, Jim. He had just spent uh, his last 500 bucks on something to do with his truck. And he was looking, this is like halfway through the month, he had like 500 bucks to do everything for his family. A hardworking guy who wanted nothing more than to be on the job. And he was reduced to this. It was so sad. I met him at the Tim Hortons in Smithers. And, uh, you know, I, I just think it's really, it's really sad that there are people who pretend that they represent what's who an interest who've got nothing, nothing to do. They've never been there, never talked to these people. They know nothing about this, this culture who are raising money off that, who are blockading our legislature, who are stopping people from going about their lives. It's, oh, you know, I'm, I'm mad about it, Jim. It's a big lie. It is. Not to say that there aren't real issues on the place of indigenous people in our society. There are. There's big issues. But to to abuse the name of this people is very hurtful to them. So many people are are hurting because of this. What kind of conditions are this uh, is this uh, natural gas pipeline being built under? Well, it's probably the most um, regulated. Some would say overregulated, but you know, I think it's it, the the the, the requirements to uh, do the work in a way that doesn't jeopardize the water systems. You know, in they call it the, I think it's the land of lakes or the lake, lake country. Lake country, if you go to the east of Burns Lake or around Burns Lake and, and, and both east and west of that, they call it lake country because it's full of lakes. There's rivers there. There's beautiful rivers and fishing. Um, you know, the, the, the Morris River is, is a great fishing river. Of course, uh, other, other systems that come out of that. This is, this is the area where that pipeline's gonna be going through. Uh, First Nations, they have a water governance system amongst themselves to cooperate and make sure that the Nachaco and Bulkley could be preserved. There was just a $200 million agreement signed by the British Columbia government and good on them to restore, uh, uh, a whole bunch of the issues around or to fix, I guess, a whole bunch of the issues around water and the state of the Nechaco River that go back uh, 50, 60, 70 years that have created a lot of displacement and and, and cultural problems for some of those uh, First Nations of the the Eastern Wet'suwet'en and the Carrier Sakani peoples who uh, I think are, are now able to say we're moving forward. And that's a big part, I think, of you know, knowing that we've got careful, uh, properly regulated economic development in that area again, um, of you know, a place that's lost some mines and less ac- less less forestry, they've actually got something going on there that's that's uh, improving things. And I think that's led to pride, a lot of pride. You know, I I've known for several years um, um, one of the, the the chief from the carrier Sakani. I saw her. Uh, this week at Prince George after not seeing her for quite a while, I was really struck by her. We had a, a good chat. We actually did an interview. It's, it's going to be uh, broadcast, uh, uh, soon. Just her composure, her, 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 I would say pride of doing the right thing for her people by addressing a number of things. I mean, you know what? The pipeline, I hear this all the time. It's only one of a whole bunch of things. They've got so much going on to serve their people they've got to get health they've got you know education transportation you know that's also the highway of tears right we all know that story so they've got you know the bus service they put in there they've got all this stuff going on um so they don't have time to spend you know preoccupied with just the pipeline 
Um, but it's part of it. And I, j- I just feel there's been a resurgence in the, the pride. And, and so, of course, the bitter twist to all this is that here you've got these hereditary chiefs. Those are the ones that the federal and provincial governments say they only want to deal with. Well, they have no responsibilities. They don't have to save one person from an overdose. They don't have to deliver uh, healthy water to one person. They don't have to deliver roads or schools to one person. It's those those bands that, that these hereditary chiefs stare at um, and say, you have no right to have a say in this. It's the bands that are doing all that work to bring uh, order and structure and services to people in their lives. It's those those all of them, four of the five band council chiefs are women and they are just they're they're working their darndest to bring their people ahead and the province and the feds won't talk to them won't acknowledge that these what and elected leaders put there by their people are are worthy of being in discussions about the fate of of the, that area it jim um, we talked about this before the show uh, to an ordinary person, this circumstance is is downright uh, puzzling, isn't it? Now, for the actual construction, you said measures are being taken mm. to keep uh, the forest as pristine as possible. Well, yes. I mean, that's the whole thing, because uh, it, even though it's only about 100 feet wide, this, this pipeline right-of-way for the land that they're disturbing, that land is being disturbed, so they want to minimize the effect. So they have, you know, I've mentioned these these pads, they kind of snap together like like Lego, and they they put them down, um, and that allows the heavy equipment and it is heavy stuff to to get close to where the trench is. And they dig you know dig up the trench, and then they drop the pipe in. It has to be welded, and um, you know this this can be disruptive. But then at the end of the process, they also want to put that land back. They return the soils. I, I drop by a forestry nursery where they. Are hoping to get some work to to uh, culture the grasses that will be planted on that right away. You know they don't just go in and put any old grass in. It's got to be obviously suited to the environment. Don't forget, there's a lot of wildlife out there. There's moose, there's uh, marten, there's um, all kinds of creatures out there where you can actually, through what you do on the land, um, you, you can you can you can create better conditions for wildlife uh, by Ensuring that you're you're handling the the restoration part of it uh, well. So this is this is always a goal when I talk to the environmental people who do these pipeline projects. And you know it, it takes years. It took you know at least uh, you know seven, probably probably more like eight or ten years to do this project through the permitting. And you know they leave no detail unexamined that they have to uh, have. A plan for whether it's archaeology, you know, making sure that they're, they're not going through burial sites, or if somehow they can't avoid it, that there's some some negotiation. Um, in this in this pipeline, I actually don't think that's a specific example, but I mean that could happen. Um, but they have to have a plan for all this, and then for the water, you know, you the the way the rivers run. At some point, you do have to cross a river. They the way they do it, um, pipelines are buried. The way we build long distance. These big pipelines in Canada, they are entirely buried the whole length. Uh, you've seen pictures from Alaska, say, where that, that, uh, um, north, the northern pipeline up to the Arctic, that is on top of the ground because it's in permafrost and they don't bury such pipelines. But, but, uh, a Canadian pipeline, you just don't see them. You don't notice them once they're built. You might notice, as you do with a, uh, transmission line, you might notice that there is, you know, less vegetation on the line. And, of course, you don't want trees, big trees, putting the roots down around the pipeline, do you? That wouldn't make any sense. So they do have to manage these corridors. But otherwise, they are they are very green and benign over the life of them. And, and they're required to be, the, the penalties for this. Um, and also one important thing, there is a little confusion. I know what's in the gas pipeline. It is gas. It's not liquefied natural gas, so it's, a, it's not a liquid. It's, it's really a gas, invisible gas. Imagine in the highly unlikely event of a break, what would happen? Well, the gas would escape, and then what happens? Well, it it just you know dissipates into the air. That's what would happen. I know there's some people raising money on the the fears that this pipeline would somehow spill oil, or or a future might be converted to carry oil. 
that, that's absolutely impossible uh, that that could happen. There would be a whole regulatory process that would be needed. There's no way um, that that would happen. So um, I, I think in the uh, next couple of years, it's going to take a few years for the pipeline to be finished. Um, there's going to be probably a need for the nations, that, the Wet'suwet'en, that, that want this and other First Nations, total of 20 First Nations, have got benefit agreements with the pipeline. They'll they'll probably be working to educate on what's really happening with it because there is a lot of misinformation about it. Just as there's a lot of misinformation about the connection of the the real Wet'suwet'en people with with these uh, protests in their name without their permission. We'll have more with Stuart Muir right after this. Engineer Gold Mines is focused on the exploration and development of the historic high-grade Engineer Gold Mine situated 32 kilometers southwest of Atlin, British Columbia. Engineer Gold Mines is fully permitted for surface and underground exploration with the drill program now underway. Engineer Gold Mines Limited trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol EAU. For more information, please visit us at engineergoldmines.com. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Stuart Muir. Stuart, uh, Warren Buffett has pulled out of the Saginaw LNG project worth about $3 billion bucks, I believe. Uh, because of Canadian political, of the Canadian political context, in other words, blockades, uh, we can't get rail goods shipped, people are blocking roads, bridges, ferries. Is this what's going to happen with international funding of projects in Canada from now on? Is that the fear? Yeah. Well, I think, um, you know, for the protesters, they must be very satisfied, very happy today that they've driven, um, at least one investor. You know, it doesn't mean the project is dead. It, you know, the uh, report I saw was that, yeah, uh, Buffett has pulled out, but but, but the uh, project people have thrown the towel in. So if it is a quality project, they'll be able to get money. You know, one of the things that the world lacks right now is is good investments, solid investments. And there's few things more uh, reliable or steady than a pipeline. If, if your goal is a dividend uh, investment, if you're a pension fund, uh, if you... If you just want to have cash flow from an investment. Um, all a pipeline does is convey a, a commodity safely from point A to point B, uh, 24/7, 365, and that's a great investment. So, I, I think quality pipelines or other similar infrastructure, transmission lines, um, wind farms, uh, all these things have an impact on the land. They could be controversial, but they do they do uh, produce steady income. <clears throat> so I don't. I don't think it's it's uh, time yet to declare that project dead or Canadian investment dead, but I think it has shown us it's probably a wake up call for you know investors who think you know what uh, these these problems are just uh, small ones that will solve themselves. I don't need to do anything. Um, I can just uh, sit back and make my investments, and it'll all be fine. Um, you know, I think that those organizing this protest and it is organized. It's not just a random bunch of people here and over there. Uh, doing things. There, there is, uh, look at Greenpeace. They've been, uh, creating propaganda and putting people in place over many years to be able to, from far away without their fingerprints on it. I watch this stuff. I, you know, I've been an investigative journalist my whole life, Jim. Um, I, I am proud of my ability to use public sources to find out information that, uh, you can't just find on Google. You, you need to dig and find out the truth. I do that. And I can tell you that these international groups with international money are abusing the trust that Canadians have in processes who, who take things at face value and think everything's going to be okay. We're, we're being abused. We're probably the only country in the world that would be abused like that. Other countries would not allow this to happen. Um, I'm glad we live in a free country where people can say their, their opinion, whatever it is. I don't need to agree with it to agree that they should be able to say it. But but I think our trust, um, including businesses, has been abused. And the only way to deal with it is to, I think, it needs to start with good information. You know, know what the enemy is. These these protests, they may 
claim to be about the rights of First Nations, so they may claim to be about, about climate. They're really, uh, broadly speaking, uh, not not about those things at all. They're they're about uh, uh, agendas that that are part of bigger strategies. I don't think they're you know it's not nefarious and it's not uh, tin ho- tin foil hat thinking on my part. It's 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 how the world works. We are a soft target for those who want to make a statement about decarbonization, um, who want to say ending fossil fuels is something that has to happen tomorrow. We can't go protest in Russia or Saudi Arabia, but those Canadians are dumb enough to let us come and do it there, so we'll go shut down their industry. This is what we're dealing with. And, uh, you know, I think the, the the proof that when you stand up to things, you, you, can, you can be in charge is unfolding this very day. You know, it was just last night that... Uh, rather naive minister of BC government invited some protesters into the BC legislature after nine days of this protest camp outside that, uh, you know, it's a very messy, disrespectful group, uh, thuggish behavior. I mean, they, they verbally assaulted a First Nations chief who walked up to the First Nation, uh, uh, or, or to the, the so-called First Nation protest the other night to ask a few questions. He was treated rudely. They spoke to him in a hostile and threatening manner. They they made a, a sort of ultimatum to him that if he didn't leave, something would happen. And they told him that he didn't know what he was talking about uh, when it came to First Nations issues. This is a, an elected and hereditary chief from the northwest of B.C. who knows these issues better than just about anyone was told these things. But, but, when these protesters were invited into the legislature to have some pizza at a meeting with the minister last night, and then they refused to leave and had to be arrested and taken into custody, that resulted today in all of those protesters right now, as, as we speak, we're, we're taping this, um, they're packing up their, their propane containers and, and their plastic uh, bins full of their nylon sleeping bags, and they're going back to the dorms that you University of Victoria or Camosun College um, because the authorities finally stood up to them. In this whole thing for the last month, no one has stood up to them. The moment we stand up to them, they real, you know, they're gone. They're out of there. So I think the, the, uh, this moment, maybe we'll look back at it one day is this moment where Canada woke up to the, uh, to the fact that you, you can't, uh, uh, if you, if you agree to be bullied by, by thugs, by a naive, uh, student protesters who I wouldn't say they're thugs, but are are led by uh, those who will say any misstatement in order to make gains in what they think is their movement, whether it's right or wrong. You know, we we need to stand up uh, together as a people and and say no to that. And I think when we do that, back to your question, that's when we can once again say that responsible, environmentally sound projects can flourish in Canada. Uh, the head of the Nazi submarine service, Admiral Donitz, called his submarine crews useful fools. Is that Indeed. what's going on here? Yes, yes. These people. Um, I, I'll go back to that. I mentioned uh, Chad Day. He posted this on Facebook. He made a public statement about it. Um, chief Chad Day is the chief of the Taltan. That's a First Nation that has uh, struggled with all the struggles of every First Nation in Canada. They've come through this, and they now are custodians of uh, mineral rights and economic development that is allowing their nation to prosper. And they're very proud of it. But they're also very proud of their uh, their resistance. I mean, it's there's some there's some challenging ideas when you talk to uh, someone like Chad Day for, for uh, a non-Indigenous Canadian to consider that we have to confront these difficult challenges and, and be ready to listen and change and adapt our ways. But at the same time, at the same time, here's a nation that, that has, you know, said the right things for us, for others. We want those things. And the proof's in the pudding and what the Taliban have done. If you look at the Red Chris Mine, wonderful example of collaboration to have shared prosperity through this. And this, I, I think, is what the, the future uh, should hold and can hold. Um, and, and when you have these, uh, as you say, these useful fools uh, out there, they know nothing of this. That they are so ignorant that they would would uh, go to a person like Chad Day who took the trouble to come and ask them what their issue was to then abuse this chief on the grounds of our legislature, a place of 
law and, and free speech uh, in the way that he related in his Facebook post. Um, just it just absolute. Uh, uh, if you had any inkling that maybe they were a bit off kilter, this was proof positive that these th- these had people just had no right to be there. And I'm so glad to see them hightailing it out of there. Stuart, thank you so much for chatting with us. Thank you. My guest has been Stuart Muir, Executive Director of the Resource Works Society. His website, resourceworks.com. His Twitter handle, at SJ Muir. If you have any questions for Stuart or any of our other guests, you can send them to info at howstreet.com. Our YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. Find us on Twitter at Street. We're also on Facebook. I'm Jim Goddard. Thank you for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. HowStreet.com radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.